Hello and welcome to another Red Gamer Tech video. Myself, Amato, of course, I'm here with the latest and greatest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. So we're going to kick things off today with by far the juiciest piece of info regarding Zen 2. As if we'll remember over at Hard OCP has apparently managed to get some info on the specs of the processor. Now, before I go any further, this is an engineering sample they're talking about. So obviously, everything I'm talking about here is subject to change the sample that they saw is obviously still being worked on you know in the post that you'll find linked in the description below they themselves mentioned that it crashes a lot because obviously again they're still working on it so we can expect obviously things things to be more stable for the final release and obviously for the specs and so on perhaps to improve all that sort of stuff so what do we actually know about this now well, the sample that we saw, again, Zen 2, which again is based on the 7NM architecture, features 8 cores and 16 threads, and can go up to 4.5 GHz. Now, while they're saying up to, that is, of course, the boost clock. The base clock is going to be 4 GHz, and apparently it was tested with DDR4 memory, of course, 3600 MHz, along with an RX Vega 64 liquid. So, while we don't have performance metrics or any real like hard data when it comes to how it actually performs apparently it is doing well versus the 8700k but it is a very early sample again it crashes a lot so we can maybe expect it to overtake the 8700k and obviously we can see the specs improve but this is the base that they're working from at present now obviously there's more than just raw clock speed when it comes to this sort of stuff we have, we have seen some fairly impressive IPC games with the Zen Plus um, improvements over the original Zen architecture. You know, AMD pretty much held to their word of the increase in IPC, and we can probably expect to see similar stories, but obviously more of it with Zen 2. But yes, while this is an engineering sample, it's looking promising to say the least. So, speaking of Intel, let's move over to our second topic for today, which is actually regarding a benchmark of the 9900K. So I'm sure you guys are fairly familiar with the leaker by the name of Tom Apisak, whose name I probably have just completely mispronounced, but hey-ho. They are on Twitter, and they are, I say, fairly infamous at this point, and they have revealed some benchmarks for the 9900K on Ashes of the Singularity, and it has been pitted against the 8700K, so obviously the previous flagship of the current generation. So with Ashes of the Singularity, of course, it gives you a fair bit of information for each test, but what we are going to be looking at here is the CPU frame rate rather than the average frame rate for obvious reasons. So, as you can see on the screen, so let's go through the results here and see what we can see. Well, we have the 9900K on the heavy batch scoring 67.4, whereas the 8700K clocks in at 55.2, which is a fairly significant increase for the 9900K. And we see a similar story on the normal batch with the 9900K having a score of 94.2 FPS and the 8700K having 85.6. Now, overall, the average for the 9900K is 77.2, and the average for the 8700K is 69.2. So, again, a fairly significant increase in gaming performance. Now, of course, this is just one benchmark on one games, but we also have had various benchmarks that leak in the past for synthetics and so on. So we're starting to get a fairly nice picture of the increase in performance that we can expect for the 9900K. And it's looking pretty decent, but I think most owners of the 8700K are going to be hard-pressed to be convinced to pony up the extra cash for the 9900K, but if perhaps you have an older generation CPU, this is looking like it is going to offer a fairish increase in performance versus the current flagship. And speaking of the current flagship, we're actually going to move over to our second topic of today, which is regarding the pricing of the 8700K. And no, I didn't just misspeak, I do mean the 8700K as the folks over at notebookcheck.net have been doing some digging and I will find you will find rather a link to their website in the description below this video 
So what they actually did is they took to the website PC Parts Picker UK to look at the impact that the shortage of the 14NM process has had on the price tag of the 8700K. Of course, I've been harping on this for quite some time now, and I, I'm very keen to point out each time I do bring it up that we have seen price increases due to the fact that we are having this 14NM shortage. So at the time of speaking, the price tag for the 8700K is $399, which of course is an increase, and you can see that on the charts on notebookcheck.net, which again you can find in the description below this video. So just going to show you the real world impact that the shortage has had on, of course, the flagship processor. It's all well and good to say, oh yes, it's going to increase prices. But no, you can very clearly see that yes, it has increased prices overall. In fact, they were at one point higher than this um, back in August. They did reach a crazy £500, but uh, yeah, thankfully not that anymore, but it, they're still above MSRP, especially as, of course, they are currently well, on the road to being replaced by the 9900K and then the 9700K. So, not brilliant, but hopefully we will start to see the strain on 14NM decrease. Of course, Intel, as discussed yesterday, are increasing production and have been quite keen to stress, hey, look, we're going to get 10NM out soon. But in reality, in honesty, while it was, it's good to cross your fingers and hope, we're probably not going to see any real-world effects from that for quite some time. So, yeah. And continuing on the theme of the 14NM shortage, we're actually going to move over to how it has been affecting AMD. So what we have here is thanks to a sharp-eyed Redditor who has basically posted on, well, Reddit, that one of the largest retailers in Germany, Mind Factory, revealed that AMD have seen their market share double since August. So as I pointed out yesterday, AMD are pretty much loving the fact that Intel are having all these issues at the moment. You know, as I've said multiple times, we not only have the 14NM shortage, but we also have the delays of 10NM as well. So in September, the market share at Mine Factory in particular were 65% for AMD, whereas Intel's were around 35%, which obviously was a sharp drop for them. And just to kind of put this into some sort of context, in previous months, they were pretty much neck and neck. However, they did go into a bit more detail than this, as they also revealed that the sales for AMD CPUs hit as high as 3,000 units per week at one point, whereas Intel's did fall to below 1,000 units per week. So, of course, that's still a lot of units, but it is a significantly lower number than their direct competitor. So obviously this is probably due to the price hikes we saw and the price hike, the price hikes that we literally just discussed because obviously you know when you've got two processors one is significantly more expensive and you know you can still get good performance with the cheaper one you're obviously going to go with the cheaper one. So they do helpfully go into a fair amount of detail here actually I have to say as to what actually makes up that that 65% market share you know what people were actually buying. And unsurprisingly, Pinnacle Ridge, which of course is the second generation Ryzen CPUs, made up a significant portion of it. 57% was Pinnacle Ridge. So we also saw the rest made up of Summit Ridge, which obviously is a Ryzen first gen, then Raven Ridge, which is Ryzen APUs. And we also saw Ryzen Threadripper making up a small but not insignificant portion. You know, when you're talking a couple of percent, yeah, okay, that's not very impressive, but a couple of percent out of a, you know, a very high number is still going to be a fair amount of processes, if you see what I mean. So for Intel, however, unsurprisingly, the lion's share of their 35% market share was taken up by Coffee Lake, the 8th generation, and 9% was for KB Lake, and 2% was for Skylake X. So, in terms of the most popular processors, as I said, the 2nd generation Ryzen was taking up most of that market share. So, unsurprisingly, we do see the 2700X at the front, and we also see the Ryzen 5 2600 as well, and the 8700K for Intel unsurprisingly leading the pack. Now obviously this is just one retailer, but it is still, you know, the leading retailer in Germany, you know, not exactly insignificant, I'm sure you can agree, and it just kind of paints again the picture that the impact of the 14NM shortage, you know, price increase, 
which obviously has mean, means rather less people are buying it. And obviously we have seen AMD pretty much loving life and people going for them over Intel due to the fact that, you know, it's cheaper and all that sort of stuff as well. And obviously any price cuts, deals and all that sort of thing that might have been happening at this particular retailer as well. So, yeah, it is pretty interesting to see. And obviously this is, again, only one retailer, but I would not be surprised to see a similar story across other retailers as well. Of course, that is a pure assumption on my part. But still very cool to see um, the real world figures here for the well, the ripple effect that we have seen of, again, not only the 14NM shortage, but the 10NM delays as well. So, we're actually going to finish things up today with a brief trip to Consoleville, as we have a bit of a disappointing piece of news from Sony. And this disappointing piece of news is actually regarding the PlayStation experience. This, of course, has been something that Sony has been doing over the past few years. We usually see you know, upcoming games and all that sort of stuff, and of course this is where we saw the PlayStation 4 Pro reveal, but unfortunately it's just not happening this year as we had heard, or we did hear rather, from the SIE Worldwide Studios Chairman Sean Layden. And he basically admitted that they don't actually have enough to show to actually make a PlayStation experience worth putting on. So I'm going to read a direct quote from him here, which reads, quote, PlayStation Experience, we've done that the last four years. It began as a sort of celebration of the 20th anniversary of PlayStation. We decided it was time to have a consumer-focused event. And then we expanded to the next year and the year after that. It became a great place for us to bring news to the fans, to get closer to the new games we're working on, to some of the stuff we may have announced at E3. For 2018, I know this is going to be a disappointment to some people, but we decided to not hold a PlayStation Experience. The reason behind that is we don't have, we have a lot of progress and now that we have Spider-Man looking down in 2019 to games like Dreams and Days Gone, we wouldn't have enough to bring people all together in some location in North America to have that event. We don't set expectations really high and then not deliver on it. It was a hard decision but we have determined we will not hold the PlayStation experience. Basically they just don't have enough new to show, they obviously, Spider-Man's out. That's been loved by all pretty much, I haven't played it yet myself but we do have that out in the wild. But it is a bit concerning because obviously they've got Last of Us 2 coming up and obviously Days Gone as well. And, you know, maybe there's some games that we don't know about coming up as well. But um, the fact that they don't have a lot to show is a little bit concerning. But it just might just be like, look, you know, maybe they do have things to show but they're not ready to be shown. Or they don't have enough new to show that would actually make a whole conference worth it. it you know, it, again, I'm not, I'm not by, by any means saying, oh, doom and gloom. Let's, let's you know, let's, let's, let's ring the bells because, you know... Let's throw the death knoll bells for Sony or anything like that. Obviously, no, that's that's that would be silly. But it is a bit eyebrow raising to say the least. But uh, hopefully, we can see a strong showing for them next year. And I would fully expect we would start hearing rumblings of what they may or may not be doing with the PlayStation Five, even if it doesn't release next year. We want to hear, hear things about it, all that sort of stuff. But for now, no PlayStation ex PlayStation experience. Oh well, a bit disappointing, but not the end of the world. Sony did have a fairly strong E3, but it wasn't as crazy as some of their previous years, and I think, obviously, what they did have to show, they have showed there, and there's not really enough new for them to show at a PlayStation experience, so I guess it makes sense. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.